Good morning. Well, welcome everyone. No, no laughing in over. It's a delight to be here to have you join us today for the second um, event today to re review and begin to plan our regional transportation plan for 2023. This discussion is, these discussions are extremely important. It's gonna set the policies that we will follow over the next 20 years. It'll also, of course, determine where we, where we spend our funding for transportation in the future. Uh, so this is a really important event. And thank you for those of you that are here today. And particularly for those of you that are in our virtual world, sorry, we're not able to all be in the same room, but we thank you for being interested in joining us. Uh, so, uh, and not even though you aren't able to be in this room with us today. This is a joint meeting between the Metro Council and the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation. Uh, so thank you. And so because that is a, a, a joint meeting, I'm going to be calling roll today. And so I'll first uh, start with the Joint Policy Advisory Committee on Transportation. So I first uh, member that I'll be calling is Multnomah County uh, Commissioner Jessica Vega Peterson. Washington County Commissioner Nafisa Fai. Clackamas County Commissioner Paul Salvas. Thank you, sir. <laughs> City of Portland Commissioner Joanne Hardesty. Present. Thank you. City, uh, Cities of Multnomah County Mayor Travis Stovall. Present. Thank you, sir. Cities of Washington County Mayor Steve Calloway. Cities of Clackamas County, Kathy, uh, Councilor Kathy Heisey. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Department of Transportation, Ryan Winsheimer, Region 1, Manager. Okay. Oh, thank you. Glad both of you are here. Thank you. Uh, TriMet General Manager, Sam DeSue. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Port of Portland General Manager, Curtis Robinhold. Department of Environmental uh, Quality, Anita DeConcini. Okay, thank you. Glad to have you, Michael. And then Metro Councilor um, Juan Carlos Gonzalez. Metro Councilor uh, Shirley Craddock. Metro Councilor Christine Lewis. Welcome. Department of Transportation, Washington, Carly Francis. Hi, Carly, thank, thank you for being here. Uh, City of Vancouver, Mayor McInerney Ogle. Good morning, glad to have you. And Clark County uh, Councilor uh, Temple Lands. Okay, I'm going to move on now to the um, to the members of uh, the Metro Council. Uh, President Lynn Peterson, welcome. So glad to have you, Councilor Duncan Wong, Councilor Garrett Rosenthal. Hello. Hello, sir. Nice to have you. And Councilor Mary Nolan. Good morning. Thank you. So we have a quorum, and we're able to move on with our meeting. So I am now um, going to pass the mic over to Metro Council President Lynn Peterson. So glad you can join us today uh, for some introductory remarks. I, it's your, you're on. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Great. Welcome to the Oregon Zoo. Um, we very much appreciate literally the entire region's support and being able to keep the Oregon Zoo uh, operations going during COVID because as you know, we had to lay off 750 people uh, going into the pandemic, uh, which meant most of the staff from the zoo. We were able to keep on the veterinarians and those who cared for the animals because there's a lot of souls here at the zoo that needed to be taken care of and the Oregon Zoo Foundation actually raised the money to do that. So we have a great partnership with them. And I just want to say we still have an asset <laughs> and we still can continue to go forward. And I appreciate your support on all of that. Uh, you know what? I also want to say thank you uh, for all of the hard work getting us towards a regional congestion pricing program. It is one of the number one things that you and I know will help us manage demand going into the future, meet our GHG emissions goals and also make sure that we're meeting our racial equity goals so that we can actually provide access to everyone in the region, no matter what mode. 
So I'm thrilled that we are here today working together as JPAC members and Metro Council on setting the framework for the congestion pricing in the 2023 Regional Transportation Plan update. Under federal law, Metro, as the Metropolitan Planning Organization, shares the responsibility for development and adoption of the Regional Transportation Plan with JPAC. We are here today to discuss the draft congestion pricing policies being developed for the plan update. Transportation literally is that connective tissue to help people within our region be able to survive and thrive. And we need to start thinking about what this region needs uh, in order to continue to be able to grow and accommodate all of that growth in the, in the future. The 2023 RTP is an opportunity to take control of that growth and identify achievable actions to make these issues better over the next 20 years. The last update was in 2018, included a charge to study congestion pricing. So here we are many years later um, on the verge of being able to implement that with our partner who owns the assets, um, Oregon Department of Transportation. So I just wanna say thank you for that partnership, uh, Brendan, and uh, everything that you guys are doing to uh, work to set up a new system and include communities uh, and, and give us a little bit more time. Because while you're running to implement, we're running to create policies at the same time. So we're running in tandem uh, together. And I, I really think that that's gonna be helpful to getting something that creates a trust in a new system. Um, having overseen the Department of Transportation, uh, Washington Department of Transportation congestion pricing program, trust is the number one issue. Trust in your privacy, um, Sam, <laughs> you know this uh, from the operating perspective of TriMet, uh, how, your, how you pay, whether it was a fair, a fair way to pay, whether it was easy to pay, whether you have a fine and how people uh, actually uh, pay their fine, all of these things, whether you go before a judge, all of these things are really hard implementation on the ground, but yet we need to achieve bigger societal goals. So we need to be able to do that together, and I, I very much appreciate it. So we're here to get together to really get that consensus going and make sure that the regional uh, congestion pricing policies for the 2023 RTP update not only mirror uh, our values, but all of the work that we did together jointly in the legislature, which HB 3355, has a lot of that, those definitions that we already worked out. And so I think, you know, remembering that language and bringing it forward and asking ourselves throughout this process, is it reflecting our values? And is it reflecting the hard work that we already did uh, with the legislature and Oregon Department of Transportation, Oregon Transportation Commission, um, and and JPAC. So let's let's remember what our framework is. Remember the the foundation that we're that we're sitting on and we're building to, and get to work. So thank you so much for taking the time to be here today. Shirley. Thank you. Metro Council President Peterson. So I'm now going to turn the meeting over to our facilitator today. Uh, Brandy Stefan is going to come. Brandy. Oh, there you are. Okay. Welcome, Brandy. Nice to have you. Who will uh, you now will begin the facilitation and the, lead us into the discussion about the policy. So thank you very much. Wonderful, nice to see you all today. So I'm Brandy Stefan and I'll be helping to facilitate the meeting and there will be lots of opportunities for you all to have some table work and discussions amongst yourselves. So just briefly, I wanna say thank you again for everyone who's watching on the live stream. We do have mics at the tables. So please speak into those when we're doing report outs or when they're sharing of information so that those people online can really hear you. Um, I may try to um, restate your questions or comments if something is not um, easily audible. The masks kind of hinder that. So, um, so let's just be kind with one another to get through this new hybrid world. So as a reminder, we are recording this meeting. Um, we'll be taking a few pictures as well, since it's nice to see you all here, even if we don't get to see your smiles. Um, so um, we'll be doing that. Also, um, the restrooms, in case you need them, are in the back through the left um, to the left. So today, as um, 
Council President and um, Chair Craddock have both talked about this is really we're building off of the previous workshop and we're going to be diving into the policies today. So you can kind of see them scattered around the room already, um, but we are going to have a 30 minute of presentations to start us off with, ground us, get some information before we go into an hour's worth of conversation. And so we'll be starting on one policy and then with your table, um, and then you'll be able to select where you want to focus. And this will be a conversation, wordsmithing, an opportunity for you all to ground yourselves and really take ownership over these policies. Then we will finish up with about 10 minutes of next steps, and then we will finish the meeting and adjourn. So that is where we're heading today. So I'm going to hand this over to um, a recording, I think is our first video. Is that right? So we will watch that and then we'll move on. My name is Esme Miller. I'm Assistant Director of Research and Assessment at the Graduate School of Education and Counseling at Lewis and Clark College and a doctoral candidate in history at Rutgers University. I'm a data analyst and quantitative researcher. Um, I'm a member of my workplace transportation committee, and I've been involved in affordable housing and sustainable transportation advocacy in New York City and Portland since the early 2000s. Um, I, was a, I was one of the 19 members of the POEM Task Force. Um, we represented a diverse perspectives, interests, and expertise from across the community. Um, there were advocates, transportation professionals, uh, representatives, representatives of large and small business, representatives of government. Um, POEM was one of the best facilitated online groups I've ever participated in, and that means a lot to me as an educator. Um, we developed and valued rapport, trust, equality of voice, and respect for each other's differences. We began with the urgency and deep history of our equity and climate challenges and evaluated policy from that perspective. We also developed an equitable mobility framework to ensure that we thought through all the social dimensions of each pricing tool we considered. I speak today at the end of 30 years in which this region has managed its growth by not just figuratively, but literally marginalizing, pushing to the margins, anyone not protected by whiteness, money, or property ownership. The housing, land use, and transportation systems that we have reliably produce two things, social exclusion and carbon emissions. This is why it is urgent to begin with equity and climate. And when you do so, it becomes apparent that pricing can become a lever to bring a more just reality into being. Having clearly defined and inspirational goals will help with the political challenge of implementation of these policies. Um, so what, what do those clearly defined goals look like? Um, I'd start with that transportation demand management is about the whole system. So not just motor vehicles, but the whole system. So starting with, reducing vehicle miles traveled and increasing mobility uh, via alternate modes, but also funding complementary strategies um, that support equity, that so support climate goals. Um, we, ex oh, we were um, particularly enthusiastic about variable pricing in that sense that, that transportation demand management is a whole system because it promotes behavior change, whereas um, fixed pricing sometimes just promotes resentment. Um, and, um, you know, it, we, there, if the first consideration is revenue, there might be a temptation to proceed with fixed pricing, which is not as effective of a lever for behavior change. Um, so what are the complementary strategies we considered? Um, uh, funding uh, transit, biking and walking, uh, both infrastructure and operations, but also things that aren't exactly in the transportation realm, affordable housing, workplace incentives and rebates, um, all of the things that can have the, help the broadest array of people 
have sustainable transportation options near where they live. Supporting those who currently choose sustainable transportation is equitable, but providing sustainable options to marginalized people who currently have no choice but to maintain a car is a whole other layer of equity. Um, it was important to, uh, so we, we talk about the, the, um, the complementary strategies, but also in the implementation of the pricing, it was important to the task force to suggest that we provide income-based exemptions to these pricing policies and build off of existing means testing systems um, so that people aren't put through further burdens of qualifying um, for those exemptions. Um, we considered a broad array of pricing tools. I noticed in reviewing the Metro draft language, it kind of seems to be focused around highway tolling, although um, I understand that that's maybe not what the, um, there are broader uh, options being considered. Um, we considered parking, TNC and urban delivery fees, road usage charges, cordons, highway tolling, the whole gamut of things. Um, what I will say about uh, particular pricing tools um, is that the task force was enthusiastic about parking fees, parking districts, because they're implementable in the short term and they're not subject to Oregon's constitutional restriction on the use of motor vehicle fees. Um, and then um, we were also in the longer term really enthusiastic about road usage charge if, if, if it's administered for equity and climate goals because of the potential to really calibrate what you're doing uh, with the data that you collect. So in terms of uh, perhaps it's less expensive to drive in geographies that have poor transit service. Perhaps it's more expensive to drive in those that have good transit service. Um, uh, really calibrate policy according to demographics. All of that is a potential in the longer term with a road usage charge policy. Um, and I don't want to see the transformative potential of that get lost in conversations that focus on road usage charge as revenue for highway expansion. Um, so. Um, my overall feedback on what I read of the Metro draft, um, I'd encourage you to think broadly about complementary strategies. I'd encourage you to think broadly about pricing tools. Um, in terms of the broader context, um, so um, our, our household is either car free or transit dependent, depending on how you want to frame it. I'm, on the, I'm either on the bus or on my e-bike every day. Um, our transit system has got some real challenges right now in terms of reliability um, and in terms of the social crisis that we see proceeding on, our, you know, every day on, on, on buses and on the max. Um, we're in the middle of a time of crisis. Um, so I would encourage you to really think about in this pivotal moment, like how important it is to really support, support reliable transit service. Um, I have a 16 year old who's really frustrated by our decision to not provide the social status of a car, but I would like her, when she's a little older and has a little more perspective, to be able to afford decent housing in this region when she's grown. And I would like her to be living in a world with the climate she'd consider bringing grandchildren into. So that's what's at stake from my perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and we will hear now from um, Dr. Philip Wu. And I also wanted to remind you all that um, you have post-it notes on your table. If there are ideas or thoughts that come up that maybe are not part of today's conversation, we can put those on a parking lot or a bike rack or however we want to talk about that, but for ideas that are not going to be covered today. So we can talk about those for later. So feel free to record those and um, Dr. Wu. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, good morning to Metro councilors and JPAC members. Uh, my name is Phil Wu. Um, I've been a member of the Equity and Mobility Advisory Committee since its inception almost uh, two years ago. Um, and my Professional background is in healthcare. 
uh, though I'm now a retired uh, pediatric uh, practitioner from 2012. My active associations right now are with the Oregon Environmental Council, for which I'm the board president, and I'm also a board member of uh, the National Recreation and Park Association based in Washington, D.C. So I'm going to give you a really high level uh, view of Emacs uh, recommendations around congestion pricing. And I think uh, in your packet is an executive summary that goes into much more detail about the specific recommendations. Um, uh, next slide. Yes. So two years ago, the Oregon Transportation Commission convened EMAC uh, to develop recommendations on how to center equity with the I-205 and the regional mobility toll projects. This was about advising the OTC on how the toll program can benefit communities that have been currently or previously underserved and or underrepresented. And there were three areas uh, the committee was charged to explore. One, neighborhood health and safety, especially as a result of diversion impacts. Two, low income and affordability impacts from tolling. And three, uh, transit and multimodal transportation options. Now, EMAC uh, itself is made up of lots of individuals with both lived and or professional experience in equity and mobility and have a wide spectrum of professional affiliations. We also benefit, of course, from the consistent participation of Commissioner Sharon Smith from the OTC. Uh, next slide, please. So the committee from the very beginning felt very strongly that to center equity, we have to acknowledge and understand history. And we know that previous policy decisions have harmed many marginalized communities. And this harm shows up in unmistakable ways that are depicted on the lower portion of this slide. So you might call these symptoms of community harm. This graphic, by the way, was developed by EMAC as a template uh, for how the committee, OTC, and ODOT can structure and think about their work in centering equity going forward. So what do we see in this graphic? At the bottom, uh, we see, among other signs, uh, distrust, disconnection and apathy, health disparities, loss of sense of place and community, educational and economic instability, and uncertainty. In the center, we see four key operational guiding principles, which, if successfully employed, result in the above outcomes, which include community empowerment, shared trust, community healing, and growth. Uh, next slide, please. So on to uh, the actual recommendations. So after two years, EMAC presented their recommendations to the OTC on July 14th at the last uh, commission meeting. And these recommendations were una uh, unanimously approved by the OTC and will provide strategic direction for the OTC and ODOT going forward. Um, building on what EMAC heard from robust community engagement, surveys and, and uh, public comments, the recommendations fall into four themes or buckets. And because there's so much more work to do and data to review at this point in time, these rec recommendations present, uh, represent intentions and promises. So I'll, I'll go over each one of these buckets from a very high level perspective, but congestion management. So the seven recommendations in this bucket balance improving mobility, advancing climate goals, and providing benefits for and avoiding disproportionate burdens to communities identified uh, in the equity framework. The revenue generation approach. This is about prioritizing and providing a substantial contribution to the low income program through tools like discounts, credits, and or exemptions to address the affordability impacts uh, for those who don't have the ability to pay. The intention here is that a rate, a toll rate, will be selected that emphasizes both demand management 
and equity advancement. Um, the business investment aspect or bucket uh, identifies and commits to a plan for increasing the percentage of dollars spent on disadvantaged business enterprises, minority business enterprises, and women business enterprises by awarding contracts for designing, building, and operating the toll system and projects supported by toll revenues. Uh, we provide ongoing funding. Uh, the other aspect of this is providing ongoing funding for community-based organizations that serve communities identified in the equity framework and that are impacted by tolling. These funds would support transportation-related activities, including, but not limited to, actual transportation services, such as carpools, van pools, et cetera, uh, community participation in tolling related planning projects and um, uh, um, uh, yeah, and, and committees, and then community education about tolling. So increasing enrollment and accessibility to the low income program is also key. And then finally, ongoing monitoring of neighborhood health and safety issues related to diversion from uh, traffic impacts. The final bucket, which is accountability, um, I think is really where the committee wants to close the loop between the intentions and promises that are presented in these recommendations and the actual outcomes. So this is intended to institutionalize, normalize transparency, and build trust. So this is, a, uh, this is a, a important, and so there are two uh, two recommendations that are part of this bucket. The first is recognize the importance of the Rules Advisory Committee and include voices representing equity and the communities identified in the equity framework who will play a significant and effective role in committee decision-making, especially as facts, conditions, and results change over time. The second action is about EMAC's successor possibly another committee or entity, but this uh, uh, successor would monitor, evaluate, and provide feedback as the toll program uh, evolves. So um, this is really kind of a high level summary. And again, I would refer you to the executive summary in your packet and even the more comprehensive and full a report that uh, uh, is already published, which is called Shaping an Equitable Toll Program. So um, thanks very much for your time and have a good rest of your morning workshop. Well, thank you so much for all of that hard work and information. Um, and that was both from POEM, which is the Pricing Options for Equitable Mobility, and EMAC, the Equitable Mobility Advisory Committee. So thank you um, for all of your hard work and for those presentations. So we're going to hand it over now to Amanda Peets and Garrett Pryor with, to talk about the Oregon Highway Plan Tolling Policy Amendment. Great, thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here with you this morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Peets. Uh, I oversee part of the Department of Transportation that works on policy, planning, research, data analysis, uh, and our climate office. And uh, we are in the midst of uh, amending the Oregon Highway Plan uh, to update our tolling policies in there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So next slide, please. And maybe one more after that, please. Um, so why are we updating the policy? Um, so we had policies that we first put in place uh, about a decade ago in 2012 um, that were really when we started in earnest thinking about uh, tolling and pricing as a tool. Um, but since that time, uh, we've learned a lot more. Um, we're getting ready to implement in some locations and uh, especially timing wise, um, to implement in some of the projects that the legislature has directed us to do so um, requires that we do some rate setting, um, but we need that structure that uh, provides some of those sideboards ahead of that rate setting, which backs this timeline up to where we are now. Uh, so we drafted some policies, released those for public review on June 1st. 
uh, we heard a lot of comments that because of summer um, and because of the the weight um, and the implications of these policies that folks wanted a little bit more time to review them. So they were set to close on August 1st. We extended the deadline 45 days. So the public comment period will close on September 15th. Um, so I'll talk about timeline here in a minute in terms of what that looks like moving forward. Uh, so what do we address in the policy? So we try to help set the context and the framework. So recognizing that pricing is an important tool. Um, what does that tool mean in terms of other tools in the toolbox? Um, so as we think about uh, triggers for pricing, like um, a, a very expensive uh, infrastructure project or uh, the need for congestion, addressing congestion or climate goals, um, Though pricing is one part of those tools, uh, we need to invest more in uh, public and active transportation um, and other aspects that as a whole address these things. Pricing is one component of that. So we recognize that in the policy. And then we talk about the triggers. So uh, what type of project um, might we consider tolling on? Uh, what level of congestion might we consider congestion pricing to address? And then what does the combination of those things look like? So we set the objectives and the, and the clarity around that. Then we talk a little bit about uh, what to consider as we price the system and set the rates. Um, so uh, really trying to fold in the um, presentation that Dr. Wu just talked about from the EMAC and try to incorporate those recommendations straight in, um, in terms of thinking about exemptions, exceptions, um, how we uh, work with unbanked folks and, and other people to make sure that we have a, a system that works for everyone. Um, and then we talk about the use of that revenue um, and how that can trickle down in some of those pieces and then the overall management of the system. So those are the components we talk about in the policy. Um, I'll just highlight for you three main, um, I think, themes that we're hearing through public comment, particularly from this region. So I'll emphasize again, this is the overarching statewide policy. So it affects all areas of the state where we might apply this. Um, but particularly in this region, I think we're hearing a lot of great feedback um, because you all are experiencing it. <laughs> You're gonna move into that. And so here's what I hear for the three main things. Uh, the first is we have a definition in our policy for uh, corridors. And so uh, there is a requirement that uh, revenue that's generated in the corridor be spent in the corridor. So we put forward a definition that says that corridor is generally defined as within a mile, um, but uh, maybe defined further within the NEPA process um, of areas that have direct impacts from that. Um, and generally that's traffic moving in the same direction. Um, so given some of the feedback we heard there, I think uh, we'll likely create some more flexibility uh, than that original policy describes, recognizing that some areas uh, don't have other options. Maybe the bridge is the only option across an area. Uh, maybe there's limited multimodal options. So uh, those are some of the things that we'll likely uh, be drilling down on and, and revising. Uh, the other one is diversion. I think that's uh, come up and obviously an area of interest uh, to this group. So uh, we do talk about, um, as we're, we're mainly talking about the interstates and state highways, um, and those are for, for longer distance trips. We have a, a policy in there that talks about shorter trips um, that are moving to the local system generally um, were purposed more for the local system in the first place. And so how does that affect diversion? So um, again, another area that I think we'll uh, be looking at the comments that we're receiving back and seeing how we adjust that. Um, but the, the bottom line is the commission that adopts this policy, the commission that's the authority for the tolling, uh, wants to put some some sideboards and some structure around things while still leaving some flexibility. And so I think that's the trick that we're trying to find in this policy is how do we set some of those sideboards for clarity while still keeping the flexibility for project level decisions that really are based on local context and they're all different. And then the third area I'll mention is kind of the, the waterfall of funding um, and how that spending happens. And so what we say in policy is um, that funding first pay for the mechanism of tolling, um, so any administrative fees, then pay for the project, and the project is defined as the infrastructure investment and any direct mitigation operations and maintenance. And then the third kind of waterfall down then to other objectives within the project area. Um, given comments that we've heard there, I think that works uh, well, when we're talking about the primary objective or maybe only objective being raising revenue for the infrastructure investment. 
when we're talking about the primary or driving objective being um, relieving congestion, then I think we need to modify that some. So that's what we'll be looking to do. And then um, that third category, which is probably the more typical category where you're doing multiple things, you're raising revenue for infrastructure and you're trying to address uh, congestion. And so we'll look at parsing that out a little bit more. Um, but what I would say, maybe we'll flip to the next slide. Uh, we look forward to your comments. Um, I'm going to try to stay here for as much as uh, your discussion as I can, just to hear your perspectives on, on the policy that you're developing in the regional transportation plan. Um, so Metro staff and ODOT are, are working together to see how we can better align things. Um, and then certainly relying on the direction from our commission on kind of where they see some of those sideboards being. Uh, so timing wise, I said public comment period closes September 15th. In September uh, at the Oregon Transportation Commission meeting, we will be uh, reviewing all the, the themes that we've heard from public comment. And we'll be talking with the commission and engaging of here's specifically the themes, here's the ways that we think we will address those themes, we'll get their comments. But that's a way that we can share uh, more publicly kind of what our plans are in that policy piece. And then a couple months later in November, we'll go to the Transportation Commission to adopt those policies officially. Um, do I have the ability to maybe take a couple questions, um, Randy, at the end? Okay, great. So I'll have uh, Garrett come up and talk a little bit more about the low income toll report. Excellent. Thanks, Let's go next slide. So, um, hi everyone. Uh, my name's Garrett Pryor, he, him pronouns, toll policy manager. Uh, and council president uh, Peterson, I think you hit it spot on. Our biggest gap here is gonna be overcoming uh, the trust barrier that people have, not just uh, between the public and ODOT, but will this actually, how is this gonna affect my wallet? Um, just the other day, I was returning a call, a uh, woman who lives in Malala, drives into Milwaukee to work, had just gotten out of homelessness, gotten into a home and was wondering how is this going to affect my daily budget? Um, and so that's the the central question. So I'm ex extremely excited to be here because uh, y'all have said uh, multiple years back uh, that to do tolling equitably, we need a low income toll program. Uh, so here we're at a draft report and um, I'm going to kind of walk through some of the headline items on where we're at there um, and would love to hear from you um, through this process or through public comment there. Uh, what do you like about it? Uh, what do you not like? Uh, what's missing um, as we're kind of heading forward and building uh, what that uh, element needs to be as a part of the program. Uh, next slide. Uh, so the wonderful Dr. Wu uh, walked through kind of EMAC and their work. I just say when we looked at how tolling programs are doing this throughout the nation uh, was extremely underwhelming uh, for their low income programs. Um, one, uh, if you're hitting enrollment of maybe like 10 to 15 percent, you're a national leader in this. Um, and so that is a, a, bar, a very low bar that we're going to look to crush. Uh, we want 100 percent. We want everybody who needs to get this uh, to get that benefit. Um, and secondly, the types of benefits that are given, free transponders, like a yearly $20 credit, uh, again, like from our committee, from community engagement surveys, extremely underwhelming. So uh, I think we're going to have, uh, from what we're building here, uh, one of the most progressive and hard charging, uh, even in what you see here, low income programs for tolling in the nation. Uh, next slide. So here's our kind of uh, top line of um, kind of headline of where we're at in the draft. Uh, providing that a uh, very significant um, credits, free trips, possibly a full exemption for 200% of the federal poverty level and below. Um, where this is super helpful is that like uh, uh, TriMet, you can use other service providers to provide that verification. It doesn't have to be incumbent upon ODOT. It's easier for the customer as well. Um, the second piece is where it's going to get a little more tricky. So uh, when we looked at what is actually the cost of living here in the region and how can you keep transportation below 30 percent of your budget, uh, the numbers say you got to shoot for 400 percent of the federal poverty level. Uh, now, there's like a Oregon health plan that does it provides benefits at 400 percent, but there's not a lot of other verifiers for that. Um, and so that kind of leads us to the third bullet point here is uh, really pursuing either self-certification or other types of easy certification systems on that. Um, and so uh, a just a few kind of DOTs have done the self-certification. It's more prevalent in the transit world. Uh, so we're trying to work on what are those lessons learned around verification, oversight, making sure where, where it'd be really hard to kind of scale like fraud or abuse of the system, but what are things we can kind of bake in to make sure that's being managed there? 
Um, and then finally, making sure where it doesn't take $25 to administer a $5 benefit. You know, so that administration cost is a lot of the work we have to work on, uh, as well as what does this do, does to traffic and revenue? Because um, on the next slide, um, here are the numbers of what those percentages mean. So 200% of the federal poverty level family for $55,000. Wow, that's a lot <laughs> to go on, uh, and then, uh, not a lot to go on. Uh, and then 400% uh, of the federal poverty level, $111,000 for a family of four. Uh, so we know if, uh, you know, what does that do if you, um, to again, to traffic, revenue, congestion management, all the goals we're going for. So that's the balancing act and kind of the next steps on it, um, but would love to, um, again, as, as we're kind of after this, uh, hear about you know the direction that you saw in those headline pieces and where we're orienting that, and then more so in the details of the report. Um, do you think we're headed in the right direction, and how can we improve? Okay, I think that's my words. We'll just have Marcy and Alex come up, and then we'll maybe hold for questions. Good morning. It's great to see everybody in person. Um, we are here, so I think you all know me, but I'm Margie Bradway. I'm the Deputy Director of the Regional um, Research Planning and Development Department. And um, we are, Alex and I are gonna give a kind of an overview of the policy and plans we're gonna talk about today as part of the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, but I wanna take us back a little bit to last year. And it was about this time last year when JPACT and Metro Council were we're vetting the findings and recommendations from the regional congestion pricing report. And we heard a couple things from you loud and clear during that time. I remember the resolution was September of 2021, so year ago. And during that resolution process, we heard a couple things. We heard loud and clear first, we want Metro to coordinate with ODOT <laughs> because we don't want two different policies going forward. So we're doing that. We've invited them here today. We've invited them to present and we're doing our best to try to coordinate. We heard that from you. We also heard at the time they adopt the resolution, you may remember you directed staff to develop policies in the 2023 RTP. But I think several of you, including Commissioner Savas, remember this said, don't just shove it in with all the other RTP policies. We need time to vet it. We need time to think about it, bring it to us early and bring it to us often. So we are doing that. You know, adoption of the RTP doesn't really gavel down until December of 2023, but we're bringing you a set of draft policies at the high level for you to vet today. And we'll have plenty of time to work on them and refine them with your input. Um, so with no further ado, I'm gonna hand it off to Alex to, go over kind of what has informed the draft policies for the 2023 RTP that you'll be discussing today. So thank you. Thank you, Margie, and good morning, everybody. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, perfect. Okay. Uh, so just a little bit of context. There have been multiple, you know, there have been multiple uh, plans that have identified the need for congestion pricing in our region. Uh, and in 2018, JPAC and Council, you all uh, prioritize this near-term near comprehensive review of congestion pricing, uh, which turned into the Regional Congestion Pricing Study. There are also a number of congestion pricing policies in the 2018 RTP itself. Uh, and earlier this year, we worked with TPAC and MTAC to review those uh, with the Regional Congestion Pricing Study findings in mind uh, and identify where we can update or improve them. Next slide, please. In addition, you know, ODOT just talked about some of the policy work they're doing, but there's these three pro three projects that they are working on that could introduce tolling to our region. The 205 toll project, the Regional Mobility Pricing Project, and the I-5 Bridge Replacement Program. Next slide, please. There's also a lot of work that's been happening around community input on pricing that you just heard some great information from on, uh, from Dr. Wu and Esme Miller. Uh, next slide, please. So the regional congestion pricing study, uh, anticipation of this uh, pricing coming to our region, uh, we initiated the study in summer of 2019. We worked with TPAC as our technical advisory committee, and we developed uh, and tested a number of scenarios related to tolling, parking, cordons, and road user charges. And we tested those against the Metro travel demand model. Uh, we developed and shared those findings, recommendations, and the draft report with TPAC, JPAC, council, and other uh, stakeholders. Next slide, please. Just to really touch quickly on the findings from that study, we, we saw that all four of those pricing types I mentioned had the potential to address our region's climate and congestion priorities. 
and all eight of the scenarios that we tested, which were uh, two for each type of pricing, uh, reduced the drive alone rate, vehicle miles traveled, and emissions, and also increased daily transit trips. However, the geographic distribution of those costs and scenarios, uh, or costs and benefits, sorry, varied by scenario, and there were trade-offs for implementing those different pricing scenarios. And that really pointed to the need for strong policy guidance on pricing projects, as well as deeper analysis of those potential benefits and impacts on a project by project basis. Next slide, please. So one last thing about the uh, regional congestion pricing study. We did convene this group of experts in the field to review our methods and findings, and they participated in a panel to discuss our project a little bit over a year ago. I think many or most of you were at that panel, uh, but it's still on our website if you're interested in watching or rewatching it. Generally speaking, they affirmed our methodology and findings, and they provide good input on what they've seen in other congestion pricing systems that could apply as we advance pricing in our region. Next slide, please. And so uh, in September of last year, as Margie said, Council adopted a resolution to accept the findings and recommendations from the final report, uh, and they directed us as staff to use those to help inform the 2023 RTP update, which is why we're here today. Next slide, please. Uh, just really quickly before I get into all this committee work that's been going on, I want to sincerely thank all of your staff. They've been putting in tremendous work and a large amount of hours in helping us uh, make these policies as good as they can be, and they will continue to do that. And we just we couldn't have these strong policies without them. So thank you so much. Um, in terms of the work that they've actually been doing, you know, TPAC and MTAC had a workshop in April uh, where we focused on that 2018 RTP policy and how it related to the findings from the uh, regional congestion pricing study and the expert panel. And we asked them to start thinking about where those gaps in that policy uh, and how the 2023 RTP update could address those. In June, we came back to TPAC after hearing that input and we presented our first draft of recommendations that includes policy language for the topics we'll discuss today. Uh, we also met with Metro Council in June to introduce those draft recommendations. And earlier this month, we came back to TPAC with revisions to those proposed policies. And we introduced additional detail in the form of action items that will help provide guidance on helping to achieve those policies. Just yesterday, we met with MPAC to remind them of the work to this point. And sorry to the counselors who were there yesterday and have to hear it again today. Uh, but we're here now today with you all to provide an overview of the recommendations and give you an opportunity to discuss these draft policies. Next slide, please. Just like Amanda was mentioning, you know, with tolling issues being front and center over the last year, we've heard a lot of similar themes as ODOT has. There's a desire to lead with equity and climate. Uh, there's concerns about diversion and how we can ensure pricing projects don't just shift traffic from one road to another. And there's a desire to make sure that the revenue can be used uh, not just for these large scale investments, but also for multimodal investments and other uh, projects that can help address the needs of our region. Next slide, please. So to quickly overview what these recommendations are that we're bringing forward in the RTP. Uh, first of all, we're proposing to include a new section in chapter three that's specifically focused on congestion pricing. Chapter three, of course, is the uh, part of the RTP where the other system policies such as our safety and equity policies live. And given the importance that pricing will have in our region going forward, we felt it appropriate to elevate pricing policy in this section of the RTP. The new section will include background information and context on pricing in our region, as well as the six new policies that are the focus of today's discussion. We're also updating other areas of the RTP to better reflect congestion pricing and reviewing how we look at pricing in the RTP's mobility corridors and corridor refinement planning work. Finally, there's ongoing work happening on the finance chapter, the financial forecast and equitable funding, which will incorporate congestion pricing and will be shared with you in the coming months. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to highlight really quickly when you and your staff will see us next. Uh, we'll be back in September after taking in all of this feedback this month uh, to share further revised policies and action items. We'll be looking for general support at that time to move this work into the next phase of the RTP update. And there will be more opportunities to continue providing feedback uh, but our hope is to really just conclude this first robust stage of input and refinements. Next slide. And so I just wanted to put up on the screen those six policies you'll all be talking about in just a moment. These are centered around the six topics that you've likely uh, already heard plenty of in this uh, past year, which are mobility, equity, safety, diversion, climate, and emerging technologies. And so when we move into our small group discussion shortly, we we'll look forward to hearing your input on those proposed policies. Thank you so much for your time, and I'll pass it back over to Brandy. Yeah. No,
All right. So we're running a little over time, but um, we did want to take a few questions if you have any for the presenters. Um, are there any immediate questions? Yes, Commissioner Hardesty. What's your definition of equity? Definition of equity. For, for Metro? So well, I can, I don't want to plan because I know people, <laughs> equity is a slippery word. And I just want to make sure we're talking about racial and income equality as compared to other ways people use the term equity. Yeah, so I thank you for raising that, Commissioner Hardesty. Um, Metro, as an organization, we have a race racial focused equity plan um, that is centered around race. Uh, for the last RTP, we had three factors that we looked at when we considered race, uh, I'm sorry, when we considered equity. And that was a decision made by JPAC. So we're happy to revisit that. So I just want to let you know that that's open for 2023. But we defined our equity focus areas based on race, low income, and English as the second language. And we took those three together. And that was the center of our work for all of our equity analysis. Um, happy to have that conversation upgraded. Oh, that's Thank fine. You. I didn't want to assume that that was what equity meant. That's why I asked publicly. And because I think it's important because again, people take words and use them in ways that aren't helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner. Great. Um, so I saw um, Mayor um, McNally Ogle. And is yes. Tonight. Okay. Thank you. Um, Amanda, just a couple quick questions. Do we see congestion pricing anywhere else in the state of Oregon other than the Portland Metro regional area? At this time, no, that's really where we're looking at it. Um, so the policy helps to define um, kind of thresholds for considering it. So speeds is a threshold, for example, for when we might consider it as a tool. And really that's the Portland metropolitan area at this time. Okay, and do we see, uh, could you discuss just very briefly how congestion pricing would be used for mass transit and the multimodal investments? Yeah, sure. So, um, so again, right now we have kind of a, a hierarchy of spending um, on, on where the funds might go, depending on, on the primary objective of things. So if the primary objective is paying for the project, uh, then the funds go to uh, the administration, the project, and then other objectives. So um, more broad objectives than direct mitigation. Direct mitigation may, in some instances, include on-road public transportation services, may include biking and walking investments on the multimodal side um, that are directly adjacent to the project. Um, for projects where congestion pricing is kind of the driving factor, um, I think that's where we still have some work to do to figure out exactly um, how we proportion those funds out to support some of those activities. I think we also have to recognize that tolling is subject to constitutional restrictions that we have, which does unfortunately limit operational funding for public transportation, which is often the primary need that we're talking about for public transportation. Um, so that's why I think it's important and we acknowledge in the policy that you need to pair things together. So for addressing congestion, for example, we should be putting other funds in uh, to uh, plus up public transportation services in addition to maybe some of the on-road public transportation investments that we can make. And is that just in the state of Oregon or the region? It's in the entire state of Oregon. The constitutional restriction, is that okay. your question? Yes, correct. That's the entire state of Oregon. Thank you. So I know I know there are a lot of questions and I just wanted to check in um, and see about how much time, because we are 10 minutes over our next agenda item to get into the small group discussions. So I'm wondering if we could maybe write on the post-it notes or um, feel free to come up to me and I can take notes for you so that we can address the questions. Um, Amanda, you said you'd be here for a little while as well. So does that feel okay? How, okay. I know there are a lot of questions about this. Um, so are we okay to move yeah, into the next? That can also circulate okay. while you're in small groups. You can grab any one of the four of us if you have questions or small group discussion. Great. So we'll staff will circulate and answer questions during the small group discussions. So um, our next agenda item, and I do want to give you enough time to have your discussions, is um, that we will break into some these small groups. We'll start with the table number that is at your table and that will be the policy that you will take first. And then um, we can bring over the display boards so that you can write directly on the boards 
or you have the text in your packets. So feel free to wordsmith. Um, again, we want to know what's resonating for you and what is not resonating for you. Um, we, we had, um, a little summary of the workshop number one, but I feel like that's in your packets and you can probably take a look. They are really fun and we're going to do the same thing for this meeting as well. Um, but I do want to get you into your small groups. So um, again, as you're talking about your policies, I believe we're starting with policies one through five, if I'm doing my math right. So we'll bring the boards over and then really think about what's resonating, what is not resonating for that policy. Um, also think about how you all want to feel ownership over this policy for the RTP. So think about that because this is for you all. Um, and so what do you want? And please just ground this all back to those um, values that you discussed in workshop number one. And again, those um, visual notes are in your packet. So you could always flip to that page and look if you want to remind yourself about those values. So we are going to do a little time check every eight minutes or so, and we will let you self-select to a different policy. As mentioned, we are just gonna kind of hover as staff so that you all can have your conversations. And I think we are ready to start. Are there any questions about how this is gonna run? I just wanna make a statement. Okay. I, I really think that being off agenda already and not having an opportunity to actually bring up some very critical points yeah. that really set the stage for what we're doing here mm -hmm. are really not going to be discussed. We just don't have the time. We now we're already limited our round table discussions um, to 45 minutes versus an hour. So I don't think yeah. there's ample opportunity to bring up some of the key issues. Now, there's some glaring issues. There's, there's some elephants in the room here that need to be dealt with today. Thank you, Commissioner Savas. Um, do you want to tackle that or should we tackle let we can go through the small group exercises and and try to get what we can get to today i know time is always limited um to that to that end we've um we've discussed that decided to make changes to the j pact agenda and we're going to actually go bring the ohp amendment back in august to talk about it again at j pact because we were afraid you were going to say that and then dive into that a little bit more as well as takeaways from this workshop we are also for our counselors we've added a work session when you come back the first day you come back in august or september i believe the date is september 6. so we will have more time with this i know it feels rushed this morning i apologize commissioner savas but yeah yeah, sorry for not mentioning that. So J packed on August 18th and a council work session September 6th. All right. So I think we will get started with our small group discussions and um and then I'll just ask you to switch if you want to switch and um, we'll bring these over to your groups.
All right, so one minute. One minute until we switch policies, or you can choose to stay and keep working on your policy, but feel free in one minute, you can get up and go to another policy. We can also take a couple outside if you'd like to enjoy the morning sunshine. So one more minute at this table. Or you can stay, you can stay at your table if you wanna keep talking about it. All right. So if you would like to switch, if you would like to switch policies, um, this is the time if you would like to, you can just switch policies. Um, so looks like policy number one is over here. Mo um, So we have six policies around the room. Feel free to get up and grab, grab a different table or grab a policy. Yeah, I think 
All right, if you would like to change topics, you have about one minute. You can also stay with this policy, that's okay too. All right, if you would like to change policies, this is your chance to either change tables or just start talking and writing post-it notes on your next policy. So, and we do have policy six all alone in the corner, emerging technologies.
All right, about one minute, if you'd like to switch. This will be our last time to switch. A pen? Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can use a regular pen, but I I can also find that. Trade you, trade you, yeah. And it smells like blueberries, so oh, double yeah. whammy.
I vote longer because it smells so bad. Oh, good. I do. It's good. That's totally fine. Totally fine. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you. All right, so five more minutes to get your thoughts down on the policies before we come back together as a large group. So five more minutes. All right, in two minutes, I'm going to ask you all to return to your original seats so that we can do our group report out. Two minutes. <clears throat> I'm <laughs> 
All right, everyone, if you can please return to your seats, I'm going to start um, reading your handwriting and um, wanting to hear what you all have to say about your discussions. So Yeah, I can just stack them up so that there's all the white people. And then I think I'll put them there when I All right, well, thank you everyone. It seemed like those were good discussions. So now please bear with me as I read your handwriting and try to summarize what I'm seeing on the post-it notes. And so I'll try to summarize those and then I'll ask you all to chime in if I've missed something or if this causes you to remember something or think of something new. So the first policy was mobility and <clears throat> I'm not sure, can you see this for the online people? Is that okay? Okay. Um, so mobility. And so some of the post-it notes are, how do we fund services, adding transit, bike, ped improvements, paying attention to the seamless connect connectivity between multimodal and transit um, as a reliability facet, primary mitigation needs to be focused on transit, Transit will be used for mitigating efforts. Um, questions about how to make this a successfully implemented. Um, setting rates for congestion pricing at a level that will manage congestion and reduce vehicle miles traveled. Develop state policies and laws that connect um, highway and multimodal spending. No practical funding mechanisms exist to increase transit coverage, mobility options, need to measure mobility at a neighborhood scale, pair mitigation and mobility um, with tolling projects and include identified funding sources, 
consider land use, vehicle miles traveled per capita, consider higher benefit subsidies or discounts for people with low income or people of color, create options for modes that must use the highway or corridors such as freight and transit, and then can coordinate with um, DLCD and DEQ to create communities where people spend less than two hours a day getting to work and other locations. Are there other things that maybe I didn't capture or that you all thought of? I think your table mic should be on. So if you'd like to say something, otherwise we'll kind of just go to the next one because there's six here. And I believe that there's gonna be surveys at your tables um, or as we're going through this, um, maybe those will be added. Jay, I think <laughs> we'll get them. Um, so um, feel free to add any additional thoughts on your post-it notes. <clears throat> so policy number two was equity. And I know this was a popular table. Um, so there were questions about making this more specific, um, changes to the word from integrate to centering, um, and maybe saying why equity should be centered. Um, using language that promotes economic justice, including references to race, disability equity is important, considering those who are unbanked, um, and then measuring outcomes to ensure impacts aren't displacing BIPOC communities, um, BIPOC individuals and communities, low-income communities, or make sure that they receive a greater than proportional share of benefits and pay less than proportional share of costs. Be clear on the recipient of the benefits. Reinvest a portion of net revenues from congestion pricing into communities with higher proportions of people with low income. Um, policy needs to speak to ODOT and PBOT policies and plans and other local jurisdictions. Um, someone said these comments are influenced by ODOT's low income report. <clears throat> Ensure zero criminalization related to unpaid tolls. <clears throat> Excuse me. Toll exemption should be offered for um, low-income families, how to develop a fareless transit system, and <clears throat> include other options such as tr um, transit, not just cars. Any, I know that there was a lot of discussion around this, so maybe anything that I missed? I think that there were, did, did I, no. did I miss oh, thanks. It? the part where the 400% level Oh, yes. I'm sorry. I just skimmed over it. So yeah. toll exempts should be offered for um, families up to 400% the low income. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Hardesty. If I could just add one comment on that. It's mm -hmm. kind of related to equity and mobility. Um, it's really not equitable for people to, to be able to be to have desires to be mobile in the region, to go to places and to have to buy a car, pay the insurance and all that to drive through areas where there is no mobility options. So that's not equitable. Equitable is not simply giving people a discount. Right. So um, so implications to, to car um, where there's low transit options. Okay, great. Any other? Yes, Mission Councilor. My, my comment applies to most of the areas of discussion, most of the policy numbers. And that is, uh, I'm actually getting back to a comment um, Commissioner Savis made earlier. There are significant issues here that can't really be reduced to post-it notes. And a discussion with five or eight smart people concerned about these issues doesn't create the forum for actually grappling with the issues and what the implications of them are. Um, so I guess this is a plea for more opportunity to define equity, mm -hmm. for example, and argue about that respectfully. But if we don't have different opinions, we don't need to have all 25 of us engaged in this, let alone the hundreds of others. Right. So go beneath the surface of just sticky notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm hearing a desire to dive into these topics more robustly to hear the differences between the all of you here today. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I, I, um, Commissioner Fine. Is, is somebody else gonna- uh, No, go ahead and then we'll go over here. Oh yeah. 
I don't know if this is on, but yes, uh, that room, you know, I'm glad you said that. And I'm glad Commissioner Savas spoke about that. Um, going back on the mobility um, post-it notes that we are just talking about earlier, you know, I came in here thinking that we would have actually an opportunity to even amend the language of how we talk about some of these policies. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in like seeing if we really want to improve the whole system, then we really have to talk about everywhere, multimodal, multimodal, multimodal. So uh, I left it off that comment from the post-it notes, but ideally what I would have liked for mobility, this would have been like, to promote multimodal and then everything in that policy under could stay in there um, just so that we're really drilling down what is the vision to improve the whole system and who benefits and who's impacted mm -hmm. uh, uh, both negatively and positively. So um, I, I think I think there's a, a more discussion to be had about these and even do we even agree this language under each policy, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think, please correct me if I'm wrong, staff, um, that the surveys, um, I think Jay just put around, um, might be able, you might be able to do that as well as um, in your packet, you could probably rip out the policy language or get it back to staff. Um, well, we'll have opportunities to dive into that. Well, this great. was this initial exercise is to start the conversation of not only the policies but the draft actions that will go underneath it so this is the beginning not the end great. of the conversation great so in case you couldn't hear this is the beginning not the end and we will have more chances to talk about that yes so i was thinking about uh dr wu's presentation about the work that was done around equity and reflecting on the the feedback we're all giving about how this process is feeling constrained and on policy number two, I think there might be room for a call out for um, really using trauma-based um, decision-making processes and, and using the same process that those groups got to use. Because when you're talking about policy, it's my belief that you generally have three buckets. You can make policy for people, you can make policy with people, or you can make policy to people. When you make policy to people, they get real mad. When you make policy for people, eh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When you make policy with people, that's where you get solutions that are durable, that really speak to the community. You get the buy-in. Oftentimes it takes longer, mm -hmm. but it's worth it in the long run. And I think for me, as someone who has a lot of privilege, that's one of the fundamental lessons I have from equity work is, yes, it's a different process. And we learn from that process and we get better results when we use a process that is truly built for everyone. It's not just inclusive, but it is built for everyone. Great. So as we are looking at programs and projects from the outset, really being very specific about using a, a trauma-based process um, for engagement, I Great. think is really valuable. So I added trauma-based decision-making for policies and I referenced EMAC and then also added make decisions with people to make policies built for everyone. Great. So I'm gonna move us on to policy number three, safety. Um, there was a change from automobile to vehicle um, and talking about the true um, phrase, reduce automobile trips is irrelevant, delete that. Um, people were talking about including freight and, and the bigger harm and diversion implications as well. <clears throat> um, and then without mobility options, di uh, diversion will continue to cause accidents and in communities, um, personal information safety, um, traffic and community safety. Um, a question about if cars or automobiles are unsafe, adding concepts of healthy safety, travel safety, social safety, be as specific as possible. Um, and for each of those specific modes, and then um, <clears throat> divert um, unsafe driving behavior <clears throat> and enforce safety issues. Anything else from this one? <laughs> 
Okay, I'm gonna keep us moving because we're almost out of time. And I know there's some time limit with a parking, speaking of parking and automobiles. Um, four was diversion. So air quality investments to reduce emission, establish vehicle miles traveled, diversion impacts also consider <clears throat> neighborhoods, even if they're not high injury corridors. Price model has to be set to minimize diversion. Um, it needs to be tracked and monitored using Bluetooth. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what that says. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Um, prepare for diversion impacts, um, get ahead of that. And the definition of diversion should include all distances, including short trips. The policy needs to be clear on how congestion pricing supports multimodal investments, going back to your comments, short trips um, and add congestion, prioritizing reliable, low carbon short trips. What price gets us to the highest revenue without prompting diversion, considering neighborhood streets and thinking about a clear definition of the corridors? Okay. Number five was climate. <clears throat> and <clears throat> again, measuring vehicles, miles traveled, limiting greenhouse gas, um, limiting VMT or vehicle mile traveled. No, yeah, numbers. yeah. Oh, two specific numbers. So making sure that there's some guides to what those numbers are. Yes, reducing, <clears throat> tell us what you're targeting. Okay. So specifics. Great. Um, identify pathways to low carbon options, making sure that there are options, reaching those greenhouse gas benchmarks, um, account for future growth. Action items need to focus on corridor specific work while considering areas with absence of service <clears throat> and no funding mechanisms exist to expand travel options until funding exists will not accomplish climate goals. Okay. And emerging technologies create varied and accessible means of payment and enrollment, including options for people without access to the internet or banking. Um, coordinate also with public information, um, very tech, which is very tech dependent. Prioritize low cost, high impact technology first and not just emerging, but also technologies, some old technology still works. Great. Well, again, I wanna direct you all to the fact that as Margie said, this is the beginning, not the end of these discussions. And so um, we will be coming, you all will be talking about this at the JPACT meeting on August 18th. Um, and the council work session on the 6th of September. And there are those surveys on your tables. Um, yes. Let's not forget that we're also talking about the funding and we found that there really wasn't a policy that talked about funding, how that's going to happen, whether it's the bonding piece, but also how tolling can be used to uh, help fund that mass transit piece. Great. And then we also had a few parking lot items um, as well. Um, defining equity, ensuring the region is in alignment before ODOT bonds um, for any of the three projects. And then also I added that um, issues that making sure we have time for these bigger conversations and um, making those decisions with people instead of for people. Any last thoughts before we wrap up and I have count, um, Chair Craddock come back? Yes. I have one that I haven't heard anyone else mention and that is a lot of this is driven around peak commute times because that's when there are the most vehicles competing for the space on the highways. Um, one alternative way that isn't very high tech um, is to coordinate with employers about spreading out the hours of commuting. 
so that we're trying to get the peak commuters through the system over the course of four hours instead of two, which reduces the hourly demand on the system and may reduce the need for capacity in both highways and transit. Yeah, great. It's not building roads, but it's optimizing the system you've got. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, one if last. I, yeah, I just wanna yeah. just build on that on a different, with a different vein. Um, the concern about diversion your, is peak period right now, okay? Put, implementing tolling and congestion pricing essentially will make it 24 seven. It'll incentivize people to divert mm -hmm greater numbers every day, 24 seven. That's a concern when we need to factor in the diversion. I don't think people realize. Okay, great. I will hand it off to you, Chair. Well, thank you so much for joining us today uh, in, in driving to the Oregon Zoo to uh, meet together. I really appreciate this. Thank you to Oda and Amanda and, and uh, for joining us today, excuse me. Uh, and really appreciate you having having this joint conversation, of course, having the joint conversation between uh, both the JPAC group and Metro Council. Um, it, the, for those of you that are in the audience that are not in this room today, we would like to get any comments or questions that you might have, your input. And so I believe we're going to put on the screen Kim Ellis's email. You can contact her. Is that correct? Do you have that available uh, to send any comments that you might have uh, that since you haven't been able to be in the room? So we're on our way. This is focused and developed the 2023 Regional Transportation Plan. The congestion pricing discussion is a big part of that. It's really important for the future of our of our area for the future of our state for the future of our world so thank you all for participating and thank you for the partnership that we have with all the cities counties and of course with our state um, department of transportation so thank you very much for your time